Welcome to Series 3 of The Great Humbling. What does it mean to be humbled? Perhaps it's to be less proud, to feel less important, even a little defeated. From the Latin humus, ground, to be grounded, and humilis, brought to the ground, made low or lowly. My name's Ed Gillespie, and I'm a poet, futurist, and recovering sustainability consultant. In the early days of the pandemic, I started recording these conversations with the author Dougal Hine, where we wonder together about the strangeness of the times we're in, the altered states into which they push us, and now, in this third series, the new moves that might be called for, if these really are times of being brought back down to earth. Ed, last series, you had this great idea to do a series around altered states. And we talked about all these different states of mind. We had state of alert, state of grace, state of play. What what else did we do? Well, I think we had state of tension and state of panic, uh, probably reflecting the mood at the time. And then that cliffhanger state of limbo at the culmination of the US election in early November. And then the, all the unbelievable fallout of willful lies, damn lies and false statistics that ensued before that invasion of the capital at the start of the year. So, yeah, wow. Yeah, quite a few things have happened since we were (laughs) last on the airwaves. But something kept coming back in lots of those Altered States episodes was this thought that each of these states, each of these ways of being can be good and appropriate at a given time. None of them are necessarily to be avoided. And the thing that's to be avoided is getting stuck. In other words, it's when these states become static that we find ourselves in trouble. So that was where the thought came from for me. Let's do a series that's about being in movement. And I pinged you and said, how about season three is new moves? So I'm curious what you thought when you read that message. <laughs> well, I sensed it felt much more like a challenge. Um, after the altered states of being and states of mind and the insights and observations around the changes we were experiencing in our nation states in series two, I said, you know, in retrospect, that was quite analytical uh, in many ways. And new moves chimed with me as a way of doing, uh, not just feeling, which brought to mind, you know, what actions might we take in, in living the great humbling? So then I had this other thought, which is if they're new moves, then maybe it's like an aerobics class. There's a teacher at the front who's calling out each move, one after the other, shouting instructions. And so <laughs> each week, each week, we're going to have an instruction. And if you like, you can picture us in an 80s workout video. <coughs> I apologise to anyone who's traumatised by that image. Yes, yeah, so I've got to say, you and I perspiring heavily in a sort of Joe Wicks like a CAD workout. So given that we're returning on the 1st of April, which is obviously no accident, your first instruction, ladies and gentlemen, is keep it foolish. If you look that up on the Urban Dictionary, you'll find a definition. A deliberately nonsensical parting farewell popularised in the TV programme Nathan Barley. It approximately means see you later and don't take life too seriously. I remember Nathan Barley. It was this brutal <laughs> comedy series about East London hipsters where this guy, Nathan, is a self-proclaimed, self-facilitating media node. And this is like Chris Morris and Charlie Brooker in 2005, before there's even a YouTube basically anticipating a dystopia of memes and vlogging and pranks and influencers, none of which has happened in reality, of course. (laughs) So that's a a cheery reference point to start the series with. Ed, before we get deeper into keeping it foolish, do you want to fill us in on what's been happening with you since we went off air? Yeah, I would say on the Nathan Barley point, I do wonder how Chris Morris and Charlie Brooker must feel in hindsight uh, about that cultural clairvoyance. It does feel like life imitating art, doesn't it? And not in a good way. And if you watch the day to day now, which was Chris Morris's early 90s news and current affairs satire, it's shockingly prescient in regard to the direction of travel those programmes have taken. It makes you want to shout, you know, it was a warning, not a template uh, at the TV. But 
Um, uh, in answer to your question, what I've been up to, well, um, regular listeners will recall the winding and serendipitous journey we began last year to orchestrate a last minute community buyout of our much loved Norfolk pub, uh, the Locks Inn on the River Waveney. And it was a twisting tale of free marketeering, freeholders, disgruntled tenants and Brian Eno. The good news is uh, we made the pub an asset of community value. So its use couldn't be changed. It had to stay a pub. We were lent hundreds of thousands of pounds in a very short time scale to buy it on the eve of auction. And then we were devastated when the exiting tenant literally stripped the pub of everything from furniture to fittings down to the beer taps and, and even a stuffed pike, which had been there on the wall for decades. But the good news is we launched a community share offer, which was oversubscribed, and we've now got over 1,400 investors from all over the world. We raised £600,000, and it was it was a really heartwarming story of grassroots people power, saving a place which had centuries of heritage, uh, and saving it for the common good, for evenings of candlelit storytelling, fine local ales and produce and live music, uh, and of course, people might remember Dwyle flonking. And so we were all truly humbled by that sort of community response. Well, I'm I'm very glad to hear that the, the pub of the long now has become a reality. And, you know, if one day a time comes when it gets easier to cross borders again and I can make my way back to England, I will look forward to, to joining you yeah. there for one of those evenings of candlelit storytelling. Uh, Martin Shaw will be getting an invite um, almost mm-hmm. <laughs> almost without question. Um, I also published my first poetry collection, Songs of Love in Lockdown, uh, which was based on the daily poems I began writing a year ago in lockdown one. And it's been lovely to get them out into the world. And I think what I feel now is perhaps the most powerful part about that is the day-by-day build of the poems and the way they act as a visceral reminder of the turmoil and uncertainty of those weird times and a bit like this podcast in a way and hopefully enable readers to recall some of those feelings moods and questions that we're all experiencing Um, and I think that's particularly important given that our general adaptability to tumultuous change makes it all too easy to forget uh, the insights and lessons that we were learning. There's something really lovely about that kind of process of committing to a daily piece of output i mean i'm on the Substack for a poet called john paul davis who i got to know through the climate sessions that we did in the autumn and he's doing this for a year he's doing this series called small gods and it's a poem that lands in the inbox every morning and it's a real it's one of those little delights hidden amongst the the mess of my inbox so yeah good on you <laughs> No, thank you. And we and we also completed series two of my other podcast, uh, you know, my playing away from home, uh, How to Survive the Future with comedian John Richardson and my fellow reluctant futurist, Mark Stevenson, uh, in which we covered topics from the future of economics, to the future of protest, the future of population, to the future of shit and the future of death. Uh, and it's very much the profane to, to the sacred of the great humbling and perhaps, perhaps the epitome of keeping things seriously foolish. But what about you, uh, Mr. Hine? What's been flying your kite these dark winter months? Well, to be honest, it hasn't really been kite flying weather here. Although the wind's the wind's picking up today, as I say that. But uh, we did get some good sledging snow for a few weeks around February, so that's been my winter going downhill fast, not entirely in control, surrendering to gravity, a lot of laughter along the way. <laughs> I've been you know, working on multiple projects, as you'd imagine. I've got a book that's just coming out with the glass artists, Monica Guggisberg and Philip Baldwin, called Walking in the Void. And if you want a taste of that, then there's an extract running on the Dark Mountain online edition today. And we're going to do an online launch for that on the, the 12th of April. There's also a new Homeward Bound series that I'll be teaching starting in early May. And I guess actually that's the other thing that happened since we recorded the last episode of season two was we had the climate sessions, this four week live series with a, an extraordinary gang of people who came together, guest teachers, including some of the people whose work we keep coming back to on this podcast, especially Martin Shaw and Vanessa Andriotti, who are two of the people whose words and ideas and stories and images are touchstones for what I think you and I understand when we talk about 
living in a time of humbling. So one thing that's been flying my kite or giving my sledge a shove to get it moving or whatever is reading Vanessa's book, Hospicing Modernity, which is coming out in September. So I hope she doesn't mind me talking about it this early, but it's just full of these kind of tools and maps for getting real about where we find ourselves, where we're starting from. And I'm just going to talk about one this week because it comes around to something that's so relevant to today's theme. And it's it's a distinction Vanessa makes between low intensity struggles and high intensity struggles. And she's like, if you have the time and the energy and the literacies to be reading this book, then you are in a place of low intensity struggle. You're among the people who have benefited most from and still enjoy the protections that modernity offers. And your life is subsidised by the lives of people in high intensity, high risk, high stakes struggles, people who don't have the choices that you and I have. And she's writing as someone who comes from that high intensity world of everyday struggle for survival and who has become a trafficker between worlds, someone who can translate, though at a cost, between the world she grew up in and the world that she's able to operate in now as a professor at UBC. And one of the things she's saying with this is that whatever the well-intentioned aspirations of inclusion and diversity and so on, all of which have really important things within them, there's a there can be a problem in that it's virtually impossible to address both those people who are in high intensity struggles and those who are in low intensity struggles at once, or to create a context in which you can bring those groups of people together without that tending to end up being a form of violence on those who are coming from the high intensity struggles. And if you want to kind of grasp what that bit is about, it makes me think of Resma Manikam, and we'll find a link to that great podcast where he's talking about this. He's saying, I don't bring white bodies and black bodies together to do the kind of work I do on embodied trauma, because that's not going to be a safe environment for the people with black bodies. Because, you know, for so many people in the world, I, everything that they have experienced in their life is that uh, the comfort of the low intensity struggle people, the white bodied people, whatever the appropriate uh, way of indicating, indexing the, the difference in a context, like those people's comfort is non-negotiable to the survival of everyone else. And therefore, you, know, you don't end up with a real encounter going on. You end up with you know, people having to facilitate the emotional needs of the most privileged group of people in the room. So if you get this idea about high intensity and low intensity struggles, then there's a passage where Vanessa is writing about that, which brings it around to exactly what I wanted to talk about in today's episode, because she says to us as readers, the ideal scenario is for the exercises in this book to help you see yourself from the perspective of those who have been harmed by patterns of modernity that you also reproduce and who may think that your veiled or explicit arrogance, self-image and sense of self-importance are, plainly speaking, ridiculous. People who are socialised within modernity are terrified of hearing or sensing their own ridiculousness because modernity codes it as a form of demotion, humiliation or belittlement. I invite you to experience the absurdity of modernity within and around you as a form of connection, endearment and liberation from the grips of arrogance, as a way to laugh at yourself and be taught by the precarity, brokenness and imperfection of our collective existence. So, wow. Mm, wow, indeed. You know, that's, that's what it means to me to keep it foolish is to be willing to see and sense and stay with your own ridiculousness. And uh, when you feel yourself becoming defensive or in denial or whatever, be able to move back to staying with that. Listen, Ed, let's not get too serious about all of this. It is the 1st of April. (laughs) And I know 
because we've done two series of this, I know that you will be bringing us the fruits of your research. So can you tell us <laughs> how this ended up being Fool's Day? Mm, well, in the sense of the absurdity of modernity, uh, which I love as a couplet, um, let's also go back to history. So it seems like the original coinage uh, of, of April Fool's Day comes from the 16th century in 1508 French poet Eloy Damaval references uh, Poisson d'Avril, April's fish, uh, which was a tradition of tomfoolery and jokes which seems to originate from the Middle Ages, when most of Europe still celebrated New Year's Day on March 25th, which is Annunciation, actually, the day that we're recording this. And April 1st was then the last day of what were the New Year's holidays. Uh, and it ended up being mocked by followers of the Gregorian calendar, which was obviously catching on, for whom New Year's Day was January the 1st. Uh, and the Gregorian calendar wasn't actually established uh, widely until the 16th century. So it was a way of sort of teasing people who seemed to be behind the times. Some people also argue that there are biblical origins, claiming it was the date that Noah rather preemptively released the first dove to search for land before the waters are debated, uh, perhaps in a sense of rash optimism. Um, also could be described as foolhardy or perhaps a, a retrospective rationalisation for the tradition of false errands, which is also associated with April Fool's. And in Scotland, they used to call it Hunty Gauk Day, uh, where Gauk uh, was cuckoo or fool. Uh, and the practice there was to send a sealed envelope with the victim um, as an envoy requesting help from someone, uh, but actually just passing the victim onto yet another contact and so on and so forth. Rather like mechanical or decorating apprentices being sent out by a tin of elbow grease or tartan paint um, in the convention. Oh, yeah. But but if we actually dig down into the etymology of fool, it comes from the Latin follis, meaning bellows or windbag via the old French fol, which were then evolved to mean madman, uh, insane, a rogue or a jester in the playful sense, becoming the Middle English fool, which is empty-headed person with poor judgment who often talks nonsense. But but then, you know, as you get down into these rabbit holes, as you do, in the Old Testament, the word fool is actually a crude translation of five different Hebrew words, which actually discern very different types of fool. So the first one is pethy which is the simple fool, which takes its meaning from being opened up. So the simple fool opens his mind to any passing thought, lacks discernment and is therefore gullible and immature, They're especially vulnerable to seduction as they lack an understanding of perhaps the irreversible consequences of moral failure in their decisions. Then you have the evil, which is the silly fool, um, literally from perverse or silly, with a mouth that gets them into trouble and who tends to anger when things go wrong for them, usually convinced they are right uh, and impervious to challenge. Then you have kessil, which is the sensual fool, deriving from the literal fat or stupid, who is determined to make wrong choices, uh, behaves unreasonably, is often in pursuit of self-pleasure with motives and methods that are subtle and sometimes hard to define. Then penultimately you have Lutz, which is the scorning fool, which comes from to scoff at, who expresses disdain and contempt often through facial expressions for those who contradict their false thinking. And finally, Norbol, which is the steadfast fool, the wicked fool, the one who is vile, self-confident, closed-minded, who aims to draw others into their evil ways and is arguably the most dangerous of all fools. And I thought this really nuanced breakdown of the different types of fool was fascinating because these biblical distinctions are obviously made in the original Hebrew because it's instructive to know which strain of fool you are dealing with so you can identify them and perhaps respond with similarly subtle wisdom and discernment. Um, any of those chime with you, my foolish friend? I'm seeing the meme. Which of these fools are you feeling like today? Yeah. <laughs> it's it's funny you bring the Bible into it, actually. I'll tell you why in a minute. But I guess I want to turn this around a little and, and speak up for being a fool and allowing yourself to be made a fool of. Because when we started talking about keeping it foolish, I had this sense that it's got a lot to do with being humbled, brought to earth, you know, falling over. Like there's that there's the moment when you trip over in the street and you have a choice. Do you turn around and glare indignantly at the offending paving stone? <laughs> or do you laugh at yourself with those around you 
and make a moment of connection out of this loss of dignity. And then I was sitting with that for a couple of days and I was like, actually, maybe that's a really sanitized version because maybe when you fall over in the street, it really hurts. Maybe you hit the ground hard enough that you lose a tooth or you give yourself concussion and you walk around for a couple of days and you're really not yourself. Do you remember the, the last time you felt really foolish? Like not just a silly pratfall, <laughs> but something where you just feel your heart sinking as you realize like the gap between what you thought was going on and what everyone else could see in the situation. And it's maybe it's that that I want to appeal to is the sense of having something peeled away, the gap between your story of yourself and what others might see. And if it is real, then it is painful and it hurts. It's not just a joke, even if finding ways to laugh together around it might help. And maybe it's like having some piece of entitlement that you didn't know you had torn out. But if so, it's also something that leaves you more alive because that thing that was torn out was not good for you. And then I'm thinking of that line from Rilke where he says, I want to unfold. I don't want to stay folded anywhere because where I am folded, there I am alive. So that's it. The experience of feeling foolish, discovering your foolishness and being willing to own it. And maybe it's like a, a medical operation, having one of those lies removed and you're, you're more alive, more able to be aware of what's actually going on as a result, even if it's not much fun in the moment when it happens. And maybe humbling is kind of you know, a lot of those kinds of experiences coming at irregular intervals. I was just going to say, I think I have a whole plethora of moments where I confronted my own foolishness in ways which, uh, in hindsight, are incredibly uh, uncomfortable. But that is the, precisely the point that Do you're you making. Do you want to tell us about any of those in particular? <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm not sure I could sum up one specific one. I, th I think, for me, it's always the revelation of when you look back and you realise that you were completely wrong. This line of thought got me thinking about a book that I read while we were away, which is Lydia Millett's A Children's Bible. And if you see a copy of it, like on the front cover, it says, A Children's Bible, A Novel, in big letters to avoid <laughs> too many irate customers on Amazon, I imagine. But it's it's a novel that's told through the perspective of this group of adolescents who's Generation X parents have rented a big house somewhere on the east coast of the US for the summer, and it's set in a near future. It's a climate novel. It's a, a huge storm sweeps in and causes kind of you know, unfolding societal breakdown, basically, is the sort of the, the context of the story. It's structured around all of these playing off biblical stories and events, not least Noah and the Flood, obviously. It's not comfortable reading if you fall anywhere near the demographic of those Generation X parents. Because it's told through the perspective of the teenagers. And maybe parents always look like fools to the eyes of their teenage children. I, I remember my dad's friend, Eric Hansen, years and years ago saying... Oh, when my children were 18, I knew nothing. It was extraordinary how much I'd learned by the time they were 30. <laughs> but what you get in this book is that thing that is just family dynamic that's there anyway, layered with this anger at the parents' generation. And it's not just a climate novel. For me, it felt like the first novel of the kind of Greta Thunberg era. And Towards the end, there's a moment where this, the narrator, Evie, arrives at this recognition, this way of seeing her parents. And by this stage, things are really falling apart and you know, the parents are really falling apart. And this is what she says. They'd functioned passably in a limited domain, specifically adapted to life in their own small niches, 
Habitat specialists, Matty might have said. My father's habitat had been the art economy. He'd moved there with ease, making and selling his looming, colourful sculptures of war-torn women. My mother's habitat had been the university, her articles full of long words and the names of other scholars, articles five people read. When their habitats collapsed, they had no familiar terrain, no map, no equipment, no tools. And it's this sense that probably pricks at a fear that many of us, if we're honest, have. Where you see these smart people who are successful in their own worlds become fools once they stumble out of those niches. You know, they're, they're helpless, sort of worse than children. And, you know, I often think this is why academic politics is so vicious as mm -hmm. somebody who uh, chose not to go into an academic career but gets to visit as an outsider occasionally is you have these worlds of people who are you know, who might have very high status in the field where they do their work but if for some reason they were no longer able to operate within that environment might have a very hard time finding any niche in which they could operate within the societies around them. Mm. Oh, that's the self-awareness piece, isn't it? it? Reminds me of the famous Richard Feynman uh, quote, the physicist, who said, the first principle is you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. And the build on that for me is like, well, but what happens when playing the fool takes you to the top? A really powerful piece uh in The Guardian last week from Edward Docks, The Clown King, how Boris Johnson made it by playing the fool. And it's a pretty gripping analysis, but we talked about the importance of the fool in series two, episode six, State of Play, where I mentioned the elements of fear and danger and unpredictability that improvisational fools like the brilliant Jonathan Kay bring to the party, which is, you know, this ability to take us all to the edge of our comfort zones where the murkier questions often lurk. Because there is, as we've already been touching on, this sort of ambiguity about the fool. Are they an idiot or a genius? Perhaps an idiot savant, where wisdom lies beneath the ludicrousness. Although in some ways that's a, quite a misleading binary. Um, you mentioned Vanessa Andriotti early on, but one of the things that really struck me from the climate sessions was her false polarity piece around the the differences between projective hope and projective hopelessness uh, which I thought was really powerful because you said both of these are, are, are false polarities they're both projections one is you know the hopeful messianic revolutionaries of techno utopianism and the other is that this projected hopelessness of fatalistic nihilistic hedonistic misanthropy uh, sort of people hating and she gave us this extraordinary image of the tightrope of humor humility and hyper self-reflectivity of asking and sitting with those difficult and awkward uncomfortable questions in between and that's the balancing act of the fool right there but in regard to Edward Dox's piece about Boris Johnson's premiership and the pandemic, it's perhaps the epitome of that falsely projected hope, you know, which has led to this roller coaster of wildly inconsistent confusion of, you know, go to work, don't go to work. Uh, we're going to illegally prorogue parliament. We're going to break international law at will. We're going to invite the population to eat out to help out during a lethal pandemic. We're going to allow, you know, key advisors to test drive their cars under the question of the effectiveness of their eyesight with their to wives Barnard and Castle children on board. Places. To Barnard Castle, exactly. To stitch up the NHS in the morning and then clap for them at night. To open schools for a day. To sue schools. To shut schools. To go on holiday during emergency COBRA meetings. To self-isolate when the shit actually hits the fan. To lock down too late. To open up again too early. Uh, to send the elderly to die in care homes to refuse to feed your school kids and then to blow you know literally tens of billions of pounds on a test and trace scheme that doesn't work so it's quite a list <laughs> um, and it's the result of those foolish sunlit uplands which are actually this sort of projected hope hope for optimism which isn't based in reality it's devoid of the sincerity, meaning, and good purpose, which is what we'd expect to find at the heart of state. 
Uh, and as the Conservative MP Rory Stewart said, you know, the best liar ever to serve as Prime Minister is, is what Boris Johnson is. And when you look at the sort of devastation that that's led to, so the estimates seem to be 26,800 deaths could have been prevented by locking down one week earlier in March 2020 and not visiting hospitals and shaking everyone's hands as the Prime Minister was doing. And even the Christmas debacle, the the cancellation at the very last minute, which led to another 30,000 dead in January. You know, the data is pretty damning. And as Kierkegaard, the philosopher, puts it, there are two ways to be fooled. One is to believe what isn't true, and the other is to refuse to believe what is true. And Johnson has quite successfully accomplished both. And this, I think, is back to the dark side of the fool, who now wishes us all to simply forget and move on from what in anyone's book should have been a truly humbling 12 months, but now threatens to be wiped from the collective memory on a tidal wave of vaccine optimism and evasion of an essential public inquiry. And that's disturbing. You know, this is this is feeling like one has been played for a fool. I was going to say, I heard the delightful Jacob Rees-Mogg the other day attacking some journalist or other by saying he's either a fool or a knave. And maybe what you're saying is that Boris Johnson is both a fool and a knave. He's certainly the latter. But if we step back a bit from the particular story of how this British government made so many deadly decisions over the past year, which you've addressed very eloquently at there is i think a larger story about the way that the pandemic has made a fool of the west as a whole in early march last year when covid was first arriving in europe i remember hearing about a civil servant here in sweden who said in a meeting why are people dying in italy that's not a poor country like dying of infectious diseases is for them not for us and actually, you know, through that first series we did in, you know, during the first lockdown in the UK, during the early months, one of the things we kept talking about was this idea of the pandemic as an apocalyptic event in the literal sense, where apocalypse means unveiling, uncovering, mm-hmm. and asking what's being uncovered, what's being revealed that was there already. So I want to say that what's been revealed is that Western societies have been hit really badly, have really struggled to respond with anything like the effectiveness of countries that are actually as kind of diverse in their systems of government and the rest of it as China, Taiwan, Vietnam, South Korea. And I was going to say this is a story that hardly seems to get told, which isn't surprising because it's a pretty humbling one. It's much better It's much more satisfying, I think, in the Western public debates to compare and contrast between the British approach and the Swedish approach. How's Germany doing? How's France doing? You know, rather than to look at this pattern overall. But then literally an hour ago, before we were going to sit down and record this, my friend Liz Slade, the um, Chief Officer of the Unitarian Church sent me a fascinating essay by a man called Samo Buria, who is apparently a Long Now fellow and founder of something called Bismarck Analysis. And this essay is called The End of Industrial Society. And in it, he makes a version of the argument that I was going to make. What he says is, for more than a generation now, the West has been telling this story about how we are now post-industrial societies, you know, knowledge economies. You've heard all of this. We've grown out of actually manufacturing things. We get developing countries to do that for us now and have the dirty factories and the, the carbon emissions for the things that we buy on Amazon because we've moved on to a higher stage of development. And what if this story is just foolish self-delusion? What if all that post-industrial really means is that we don't actually know how to make the stuff we rely on anymore. And Buria has got a whole historical analysis of how we got here. And I only read it just before we sat down to record, so I haven't had the chance to probe it yet. But he says things like this that ring true to me. 
We have lost the implicit knowledge upon which our industrial systems functioned even as recently as a few decades ago. That knowledge cannot be regained absent the people who actually built and understood those systems. You know, one of the things he describes, which is I really recognise, is this pattern where we no longer know why something works, we just do it. And particularly at the level of our social technologies, our ways of working together, so what I was planning to say about this before I read Burya's article is that it feels like a doubling of something that Ivan Illich says about industrial society itself. Because Illich says that industrial society creates a new kind of human being characterised by an unprecedented helplessness. We don't know how to build our homes, to grow our food, to care for our sick, to bury our dead. We don't know how to pass on knowledge and these are things that every human community prior to the rise of industrial society had to be skilled in doing. Whereas in an industrial society, all of these skills that used to be part of the vernacular, something everyone knew how to do with help from their family and community, become skills we are dependent on experts of one kind or another to provide for us. And then what I think becomes clearer in the wake of the pandemic is that post-industrial society is that same process writ large. Except now it's not individuals and communities that have outsourced the ability to meet their own needs to larger and more abstract and in some ways more efficient systems of state and market. Now we're talking about whole societies that have outsourced the ability to deliver industrial goods and services to other parts of the world even while loudly insisting that those parts of the world are more backwards than us, <laughs> because we're so over the industrial phase of development. And I think that's the state of foolishness that we're now in. And it's actually a lot like the state of the parents in Lydia Millet's novel. And I don't know exactly where Sam Burry is coming from and whether or not he'd go along with my Illichian version of this story except that the very last line of his essay does have this Illichian note to it. Here's how he ends up after this kind of big, fascinating essay on the end of industrial society. He says, Whatever solution our civilization might find to escape the post-industrial trap, it will require social technologies of production and knowledge very different from anything we've seen before. A good place to start would be a new basis for friendship that defeats atomization and a truthfulness that is compatible with political loyalty. There's a tragic poetic image that encapsulates some of that infantilization, if you like, as you say, of exporting um, industrial production because we're so over it. And some of that unfolding right now uh, with the gargantuan cargo ship, uh, which is called the Ever Given. Uh, which is just, yeah. I mean, you can't write this stuff in terms of the serendipity, but it's 220,000 tons of industrial beached whale laden with consumer goods that have been traveling obviously halfway around the world from their sites of production to our destination markets. And there's something inherently darkly funny and foolish that, you know, as a sustainability buddy on a WhatsApp group I'm on pointed out this morning, that our consumerism has got so huge and unwieldy that it has veered off course and blocked a vital channel of connection between us. Uh, and that is quite, quite a metaphor. I'd like to sort of finish my contribution on the, on the paradox of the wise fool. The wise fool is the one who, through boisterous merrymaking and the non-adherence to social conventions, without any respect for propriety, uh, enables actually a childlike innocence and deceptive simplicity of perspective to emerge, which is a bit like uh, what Buria seems to be talking about in terms of the defeating of atomization. And we have also have to be cautious of the way the wise fool is often rejected. And I went back to Plato's cave, you know, where one of the prisoners who've been imprisoned in the cave since birth escapes and returns to free his fellow inmates, only to be dismissed as a madman with his tales of a world that lies beyond. And perhaps that lands us on the Socratic paradox, where Socrates famously said, I know that I know nothing, <laughs> perhaps making him the wisest of all fools.
And I finish with this idea that are we wise enough to play the fool and to keep it foolish? Or are we just foolish enough to be played by them? What if the only chance we have is to reveal our foolishness to ourselves and each other? What if the only route through the kind of mess that from very different angles, I see Sam Aburia and Vanessa Andriotti uh, gesturing towards involves those of us who, according to the, you know, the sensible grown-up stories, the inspiring stories told in TED Talks and all of the rest of it, are you know, the winners, the pioneers, the ones who stand at the forefront of progress, like admitting that we're wearing no clothes, admitting that we are a society of naked emperors at some really you know, basic level. And maybe that's what I was trying to get at back in the early days of Dark Mountain when I wrote this thing that said, it's time to stop pretending. Mm -hmm. What do we do after we stop pretending? What does stopping pretending mean? Maybe keeping it foolish and being prepared to sit with our own ridiculousness is the necessary transition towards whatever else that might have a chance of meaning thank you for listening to the great humbling if you're new to the podcast we'd invite you to check out the journey we've been on over the earlier episodes in series one we explored the sense making stories taking shape through the first months of the pandemic And Series 2 tracked the altered states of consciousness, being and feeling that we were seeing around us. This is an open-ended process, and we're keen to hear from you. So please do comment, ask questions, and respond via our Facebook page, The Great Humbling, or on Twitter, where Ed is at FruCool. We're grateful to all of you who've been giving ratings, reviews and recommendations and sharing this podcast along your networks. And if you want to get deeper into the territory we explore in these conversations, do check out a schoolcalledhome.org where you can sign up for live online courses and events. These are extraordinary times, a moment of initiation at a cultural scale. So thank you for being with us on this emergent journey.